All right, I'm going to begin by introducing the uh, SAMHSA team. Um, I believe all are on the line today. Maureen Boyle is the lead uh, public health advisor uh, with SAMHSA. Richard Dorison, uh, public health advisor with SAMHSA, um, who's been involved with the um, data segmentation for privacy and a lot of the stuff that we're, we're talking about here for a very long time. And Ken Salyard is a special health IT advisor at SAMHSA. Here on our side with FEI Systems, FEI Systems was uh, founded in 1999. We're based in Columbia, Maryland. Um, we're focused uh, on uh, health IT. We specialize in behavioral health care. Um, and we've been supporting uh, SAMHSA on a number of uh, projects for a number of years. Uh, we're a certified 8A uh, company. Um, we are uh, certified for CMMI, CMMI Maturity Level uh, 3. That's a software development um, methodology uh, certification. Uh, and we're at about 150 employees and, and consultants at this time. So on the FEI team, we have Rodney Conrad, who's our OVITA project director. Uh, myself, uh, Bear Polk, I'm the OVITA project manager, and I also manage the uh, software um, development team here at FEI. Uh, Joel Amasu, who will be giving our uh, uh, technical presentation today, is our interoperability and, and systems architect, and he's the, the development lead for uh, Consent to Share ACS. Uh, Brock Tassel, who's uh, uh, one, another one of our uh, software developers, um, he was uh, FEI's development lead on the uh, VA SAMHSA uh, ds b pilot that was demonstrated um, at HL7 in September and also at the uh, HIMSS uh, 13 conference. And then Ludwin Nahara is our user experience architect for Consent to Share. So what is the OVITA project? OVITA stands for Open Behavioral Health Information Technology Architecture. Um, it's a five-year contract. We are currently in the fourth year of the contract. Uh, FEI is the uh, uh, prime contractor for, for SAMHSA. Uh, we're developing reusable open software components and uh, behavioral health standards, finding behavioral health standards. Again, if you uh, if you're uh, on the call, if you please take a minute to, to, to mute your phones. Um, what things have we done on the OVITA project? Um, we put together uh, ASAM Criteria software, which is a um, re-implementation of the ASAM Patient Placement Criteria Assessment Tool. We're working on an assessment platform called ProCenter, which is going to be an open source uh, platform for delivering uh, assessments. We participated with the Veterans Administration against the DS4P pilot, where we demonstrate a prototype implementation of the DS4P implementation guide at uh, HIMSS 2013. And then what you're going to see today is consent to share, uh, patient consent uh, management, and access control services. Uh, and we are also working on defining uh, behavioral health uh, standards. Uh, we're working with, on behavioral health CCD and health uh, healthcare uh, security classification system. So, what is consent to share? Consent to share. Uh, Hi everyone. I, I'm sorry. This is going to probably interrupt some of our questions, but I went ahead and just uh, muted the the group due to uh, due to feedback and stuff we had coming through. So if you do have a question, please go ahead and uh, raise your hand. Um, I'll try to keep an eye here on the uh, on the uh, chat window. <clears throat> so uh, consent to share uh, consists of two areas: patient consent management and access control services. Um, goals and objectives of the project. Uh, we want to demonstrate that privacy, uh, consent, and data segmentation software uh, can be used to allow patient health record sharing in an environment where privacy regulations are currently an impediment, uh, specifically in uh, 42 CFR Part 2 environments. Uh, to show how privacy, consent, data segmentation uh, tools and standards uh, can allow uh, patients receiving behavioral health treatment share their information while providing improved protection of their policy. So I really hope here is that the um, uh, tools that, that we're implementing here are actually going to um, have, allow patients and encourage patients to share more 
and share more often. Uh, objectives, develop a production grade privacy and consent management system, which is capable of supporting a pilot implementation, uh, which demonstrates that patient health records can be successful within the privacy constraints of a 42 CFR Part 2 environment. And by the fall of 2013, deliver a consent to share system that is ready for a pilot implementation. So in short, we're getting the system right now ready uh, to hope to be ready to roll out with a pilot in the uh, fall of 2013. Um, so what we're about to show you today uh, is going to be some actual software that we have developed. We got about four months ago on the project. Um, so we'll also be talking about some things in, in, in the 2B um, format. I'm going to unmute everybody just for a second here. Just any questions? Actually, this is Lisa Moon from uh, Minnesota, and I'm wondering, is this customizable with state laws as well? You're talking about the federal law, um, HIPAA, but if there are any um, components of state law that may be, um, you know, may make this more complex, is there any way to um, customize? Hi, Lisa. Thanks, thanks for your question. Um, yes, it is, it is uh, customizable for, uh, for privacy policies. and. Uh, when we get into this, the, the uh, section where Joel is talking about the architecture, we'll probably we'll go into that in more detail. Um, and if, that, if you don't see how that works at that point, uh, just raise your hand again at the end of the uh, at the end of the session. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Group back, uh, putting everybody back on mute, and here we go. So uh, talking about uh, a pilot in the fall, what we'll be looking for uh, for a partner to uh, pilot with. Um, number one, a pilot needs to be uh, a, um, uh, a provider and an HIE that already has the need to share uh, patient data across provider sites. Um, we're going to be looking for at least one of the provider sites in the pilot to be a Part 2 facility. That's very important because uh, for SAMHSA for Behavioral Health, we want to prove that the system works in a Part 2 environment. Uh, at least one of the provider sites in the pilot uh, provides primary care. Again, we want to be able to demonstrate that we can go um, share records from Part 2 uh, facility into general or primary health care. Uh, patient health information needs to obviously occur between the Part 2 providers and the non-Part 2 providers. Uh, provider uh, sites for the pilot have implemented and are already using a certified EHR. Um, so we'll be, uh, we need to plug into an EHR and, and we're looking for EHRs that are certified. The uh, provider EHRs um, must be able to produce CCD records in a C32 format or the new CCDA. If you're a certified system, that really should be covered by the fact that, um, that the provider site would be um, um, will be certified. And um, finally, it must be an environment where the uh, provider has an established connection to a health information exchange to an HIE. Okay, as I mentioned, that the uh, consent to share has um, uh, two main areas that we're going to talk about. The first is patient consent management. Uh, patient consent management is where Patients will actually go in, specify their consent to share records, and also specify any privacy uh, concerns or privacy policies that they have. So it's patient can fa uh, facing consent management UI, um, key features. Uh, one, we need to actually educate the patients as to what uh, patient privacy options are. So that when a, a patient goes ahead and provides their uh, consent, they're providing informed consent. Um, just a note, we're evaluating e-consent um, uh, tools that are out there and may do a possible uh, integration if that makes sense. Um, define which providers, patients will be able to find which providers they want to share their records with. They'll be able to define their uh, privacy policy and sign their electronic consent. Try their privacy policy against their actual health record, where they'll actually say, take my record and apply the policy and see what happens to it to be able to uh, receive and send messages from providers who have or want to establish a sharing connection. 
and also, finally, they'll be able to delegate the management of their privacy rights um, and consent to a caregiver. So in a case of um, if you have uh, minors or uh, somebody that is out, out of their facilities and, and needs, uh, uh, needs their privacy policies to, um, managed by somebody else, that can, that can be allowed. Uh, we will dig into these in much greater detail. You're actually going to see a demonstration of the pieces that we built. And we're also going to talk a little bit more about the standards and the technologies when we get into the architectural part of the, uh, of the presentation. Uh, just some of the technical highlights. We're using HTML on our front end. We're using responsive web design. Uh, this is important because the UI that we're building could actually, will actually be able to be used on tablets and on mobile phones as well as on the desktop. Uh, it's a cloud-based system modeled after the Kantara concept, uh, providing secure privacy uh, policy and consent storage. Uh, we support both LDAP and, and OAuth 2 implementations. Uh, we'll be validating the um, privacy consent through Red Hat penetration testing, and we provide customizable uh, consent forms. Um, as we know, there are different versions of Part 2 uh, consent throughout the nation. Um, there's ability to, to customize those. So again, everything you see on this page we're going to dig into in, in greater detail here in just a minute. The second part of consent to share is the access control services. Uh, the access control service is really the back end of the system that really controls the sharing of records. Um, we'll be implementing XDS repository, a policy decision point using WSO, an implementation of WSO2, a segmentation service with, which actually uh, changes and updates the patient's record um, per their privacy policy before it's being uh, sent on to the um, prior that's being shared with. A business rules management system, we're implementing rules for the specification of uh, uh, rules for the systems. We have an integration of terminology services to support that. Um, policy integration points with, uh, with HIEs, um, other integration points with HIEs, and also uh, the ability to do jurisdictional and organizational uh, privacy policy management. I think that's very closely related to, uh, to Lisa's section. So again, we're going to go into all of these in, uh, in greater de detail here in just a minute. I'm going to go ahead and turn the uh, presentation here over to Joel Amasu. He's our uh, uh, technology standards and interoperability architect. He's a technical lead on the project. Um, before we do that, I'm going to unmute everybody here real quick. And um, if there's any questions before we move on to the next part. OK, is everybody uh, able to hear me OK? Yes, you know, you're fine. OK. All right. Joel's going to talk about uh, in a little more detail about the architecture. Yes, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the architecture of, of a system. Uh, consent to share is a patient-facing web application, uh, which means that patients can capture and design and revoke their consents uh, anytime and anywhere. So the system can be accessed uh, from different devices. We only have one site, but the site is accessible from different devices, from a smartphone, a tablet, or a desktop computer. Uh, we are using a framework called Bootstrap. It's a responsive web, web design framework, which allows us to have only one website, but to serve different devices. In addition to client devices, uh, we also have a web API. So applications like EHR, can interact with our system using that web API. Uh, now, the, comp the system itself, uh, itself uh, includes different components, uh, uh, providing different functionalities. Uh, in terms of security, we have two-factor authentication. Uh, normally, uh, when you log in into a, a web application, you provide a username and password. Uh, however, the username and password can be hacked, can be stolen. Uh, and so in, in order to increase the strength of authentication, what we do is we provide a second factor. So the first factor is what you know, your username and password, and the second factor is what you have. What you have is a device, a phone. So what we do is we send you an SMS message with a code. 
Uh, and you need to enter that code into a system in addition to your username and password before you authenticate it into a system. So that really increases the, the, the strength of the authentication to prevent people hacking into your account. Uh, so that is called two-factor authentication. Uh, we can also leverage the uh, master patient index. Uh, most HIEs, uh, health information exchanges, uh, uh, have what is called the master patient index. Uh, and, and that contains demographics information about all patients. Uh, and we can use that uh, to get demographics information for, for, for users of the system. So if we decide to integrate with an existing HIE or a hospital, uh, we can use the existing MPI to, to, uh, as, as a user demographics information database for our system. The CCD locator service. Uh, as you know, a stage two of meaningful use requires compliance or implementation of the CCDA specification, the cons consolidated CDA specification. So our system is able to retrieve uh, 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 CCDA documents from, from participating EHR systems, or we can also give patients the ability to upload their CCDA documents into our system. Uh, terminology service. Uh, the goal of, of this system is to allow patients to specify um, what kind of information they want to share. And so we can provide the patient the ability to look up the terminology service. For example, uh, if a patient wants to specify their sharing preferences, they want to sh let's say they want to share a specific condition, or they want to share a specific lab result, or a specific uh, 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 medication. Uh, using a terminology service, the patient can look up the code, the SNOMED code, for example, for a condition, or the uh, RSNOM code for a medication, or uh, the LOIN code for a lab result. So that's what we use the terminology service for. We also have an inbox functionality uh, that allows patients to communicate with their providers. So the provider can send a message to a patient requesting their consent. Uh, we also use the inbox functionality to, pro to provide notifications to, 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 to the users of our system. Uh, we, we are going to implement the direct protocol for secure email so that the uh, messages that are, that are exchanged between the patient and, and her providers, uh, those messages are secure uh, using the direct protocol. Uh, we also have the ability to call what we call the segmentation service. So data segmentation means the, uh, the, the process of redacting sensitive information out of a medical record, or maybe the process of uh, encrypting a document, or tagging the document. So that's what data segmentation is. So uh, the consent to share system can call uh, the segmentation service so that patients can visualize the uh, the, the consequences of their, of their privacy selections. Uh, so uh, by, 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 by calling that service, uh, the user can see uh, what, uh, what the document will, lo will look like after we, we redact the information out of it, for example. Uh, we have an audit log uh, functionality that is used to, to audit every single action in our system. So all activities in the system uh, are are recorded uh, for, for, uh, for audit purposes. Uh, we have an NPI lookup service. So essentially, when, the, when, when a patient is, is creating their privacy preferences, they are selecting providers they want to share information with. Uh, so we, are, we have a, 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 a database, a national database of, of all providers in the US. And so a user can select a specific provider they want to share information with. And we can retrieve the NPI of that provider. So that gives us a high precision uh, in, 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 in selecting exactly uh, the providers that the patients want to share information with. Because we have those NPI, those NPI uh, numbers are really unique identifiers for providers in the US. So we actually use the NPI in, in specifying the consent uh, 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 for, for sharing clinical documents. Uh, our goal is to completely eliminate paper 
from a process so that the patients can create uh, their consent uh, online, but they can also sign uh, uh, their consent using electronic signature. Uh, and we are using an, an e-signature package from Adobe called EcoSign. Uh, the e-signature functionality provides what is, what, what is called non-repudiation. So after a patient signs a consent, uh, they can no longer deny that they have signed it. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the e-signature can be uh, it, 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 uh, can be admitted in the court of law. Okay, it's, it, it provides a legally binding document. So once a patient provides uh, adds an e-signature to their consent, that consent document becomes a legally binding document that can be used in the court of law. So uh, my, my colleague Burak is going to show you a demo of, of, of how all that works. But once a patient creates their consent in the system, we can export that consent uh, in the standard compliance format. So uh, we have, we, currently we support two different standards. One is what is called the CDA R2 Consent Directive. That is an HL7 specification for consent directives. We can export consents into CDA R2. We also have a second standard called ZACML which is the Extensible Access Control Markup Language. Uh, it's an XML specification for uh, exchanging executable uh, uh, consent policies. So we can export consents from our system in CDR2 or ZACML. Uh, Joe, before yeah. that, I just want to mention uh, Lisa Moon's question yeah. that we were going to address at the architecture where she wanted to know if this was customizable for state laws. Yes, uh, absolutely. So, so for example, we, 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 I mentioned ZACML, which is a, 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 an access control markup language. We can capture not only patient consent directives, but also organizational directives. So, for example, a, a hospital, a, a healthcare provider, can have organizational uh, privacy policies. In addition to organizational privacy policies, we can also have what, what, what we call jurisdictional policies. So at the state level, at the county level, uh, we have state privacy laws. So we can also capture those uh, state privacy regulations. And then we have federal laws, or maybe, maybe potentially international laws. So uh, definitively, we are able to capture uh, privacy policies at the patient level, at the organizational level, at the jurisdictional level, and at the national level. Joe, I'm going to go ahead and unmute the audience here. If you have any questions, please, for the next slide. Yes, hello. Hi. Should I go first? Uh, go first. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Real quickly, I was just going to ask, have you had an opportunity to configure any state regulations and demonstrate it working? Is that part of what you want to do in the pilot? That's actually part of what we want to, want to do in the pilot. Um, as we put the uh, system together and we're testing it, we will be either mocking somewhere or using somewhere likely in the, uh, in the uh, testing out the system before we go to a pilot. Yes. So the question was if we are currently supporting state regulations, specific state regulations? Or? Right, who's the policy authority and what we're lying parties are so, so currently, our system is designed to support HIPAA privacy laws as a 42 CFR Part 2 regulation. Uh, 42 CFR Part 2, uh, uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, but 42 CFR Part 2 is, is uh, uh, a federal regulation for the exchange of substance abuse and mental health, mental health uh, uh, medical records. Uh, so we, we, we currently support 42 CFR Part 2 in HIPAA, uh, but we can also customize the system to support specific state privacy laws. Uh, I, um, uh, how much does it cost for one uh, 42 CFR drug abuse program to purchase or, or to use your system? So the, uh, the system is uh, open source, uh, and it will be uh, available to anyone. However, the actual cost for individual uh, providers is not known at this time. Uh, this, is, 
This is Chan Lee from Delaware. Uh, my, my question is, um, and, and I represent the state HIE in Delaware, and so we already have some of these components. You know, we already have an MPI service, and we have a record locator service. Um, um, you know, direct is something that is becoming ubiquitous. Every EHR is going to have their own and so forth. So is it possible to kind of use yeah. pieces of what we already have and add in components uh, from your architecture here that we maybe don't have? Yeah, at the, the way the system is being built, it is, uh, um, it is loosely coupled. There will, will be some things we reuse. But we also understand that when we go in to uh, integrate with an HIE in a, in a pilot setting, that it's actually better if the, if the uh, HIE, for example, has an MPI of its own. Uh, so there, there would be specific uh, uh, duration decisions depending on what, what the capabilities of the HIE were. So this is, this is Lisa again from Minnesota. Are you looking for a federated HIE system then? Or like Minnesota has a more market-based approach to HIE. What, what would you actually be looking for for that pilot? Oh, I think the main thing for us is really standard compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether you have a centralized or, de or decentralized architecture is not really important. Uh, uh, I don't uh, remember that one. I just know I haven't seen that yet. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, Joel. Yes. Yeah, so. Yes, so, so we, we, we realize that some HIEs have a centralized architecture and some other have a more decentralized architecture. Uh, but as long as the, the HIE is supporting standards like SDSD or uh, the patient uh, demographic query standard, uh, we, we, can, we can work with any HIE architecture. As long as the HIE implements uh, uh, the, the uh, available standards. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, my name is Lee from Maryland. How many people are you planning to have for this pilot? And if so, what's the process for applying? Well, uh, this is Bear Polk. Um, we're looking for uh, one pilot. Um, and again, the um, uh, the criteria uh, were in the earlier part of the presentation. Um, must have a Part Two provider. Must be exchanging records with pr uh, primary or general health care, and uh, must have must have an HIE in, in uh, uh, an HIE in place. And so far as the um, process, um, I mean that's still uh, in the works right now. I'm going to go ahead and actually uh, defer that question to the uh, to the SAMHSA team if. Uh, Mari, maybe if you want to comment on that. I wanted to mention one. Um, sorry about that. I <laughs> started talking before then. Um, there's actually two things that I wanted to mention. One is, um, is I just want to make it clear that you know this system is designed to be able to um, comply with any privacy policies. And um, you know our main use case is part of the CFR Part Two, but designed to be able to um, comply with any. And we just want to make it clear that. The Office of the General Counsel has not reviewed this, so um, SAMHSA is not at this point you know, making any um, guarantees that, you know, that how the system is used will be Part 2 compliant, uh, although that is our intention, um, is, is for it to be able to, to achieve that. Um, the other thing about the pilots is that you know, we have in our key out right now um, to identify a contractor who will lead. Um, a pilot with an HIE and, um, as I mentioned, a Part 2 provider um, and a pilot. Um, until we've um, actually issued that contract, um, we won't know exactly how we're moving forward with, um, with you know, what criteria we're using and, uh, and what method we're using to select the pilot. Um, but I do want to make it clear that it is a very small pilot. Uh, we have funding for basically one. 
Um, and so, you know, part of the reason we wanted to have this demo is because, you know, we believe that this system will be useful for a, a large number of participants. Um, and we wanted to invite, you know, even those who, who won't be selected as the pilot, you know, if there, you know, any systems that are interested in getting on board and becoming a, a you know, a participant in this, in this community project, you're more than welcome to use the code and, um, and participate in the pilots, um, just, you know, obviously with, um, without, without funding from SAMHSA. Thank you, Maureen. And again, uh, this is Bear. I'm going to ask everybody, please, again, check your, um, uh, check your mics and your phones. Um, it looks like we have a phoning caller that uh, has a lot of background noise that's coming in. Um, I think we're uh, able to uh, mute everybody and hear the uh, presenters here. But insofar as the comments and from the uh, SAMHSA team, it's very difficult to hear. Thanks. Okay, we're going to. I'm going to go ahead and go ahead uh, to the next slide here. We're going to talk a little bit more about how the uh, how the system works. So this is kind of a deployment diagram. Uh, we have flexibility in how the system is deployed. Uh, this specific diagram is showing the system uh, deployed in the cloud. So uh, for a specific HIE or healthcare provider or even an ACO, uh, an accountable care organization, we can actually host this system in the cloud uh, and uh, the system can be used by patients, providers, policy experts, uh, administrators uh, uh, directly from the cloud and uh, EHR applications uh, can also communicate uh, with the consent to share application in the cloud using the web API. Uh, which is a RESTful API based on JSON, and which is also using OAuth 2 for authentication. Uh, but we have deployment flexibility. So depend, depending on the deployment topology of, of, of an HIE, uh, 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 our system can, can really accommodate uh, different uh, deployment topologies. Okay, so how we build the system. This is a Java-based web application using the Spring Framework. Uh, we have uh, traditional layers of an application, uh, the presentation layer, the application layer, the domain layer, and the infrastructure layer. Uh, at, on, on, uh, on the UI, what we call the presentation layer, we use HTML5 and CSS3. Uh, we use a responsive web, web design framework called Twitter Bootstrap. And Twitter Bootstrap is what allows us to have one single site across devices and across platforms. We use jQuery uh, for to have an interactive UI experience, user, user experience. Uh, the framework, the UI framework is based on a Spring MVC framework. The application layer is, is responsible for uh, transactions and security. Uh, we use uh, Spring Dependency Injection, Spring Aspect Oriented Programming, Spring Security. Uh, the domain layer uh, contains the domain entities. Uh, those domain entities are completely based on standards. So, for example, uh, the domain entities can be exported into CCDA, so our system can import or export uh, clinical documents in CCDA format. We can import or export policies in CDA article consent directives or XML format. Uh, the domain layer also includes uh, business rules, uh, repository interfaces, domain services. The database is MySQL, uh, but because we have a repository abstraction, we can actually plug in other uh, uh, storage mechanisms. For example, we could use a document database like MongoDB. We also talk to external services using web services. So for example, for e-signature, the e-signature functionality is actually provided by a web service that is hosted in the cloud by Adobe, and we communicate to, with that uh, hosted e-signature service using a sub-client in our system. Uh, so at a high level, so it's Java EE, it's Spring, uh, it's used service-oriented architecture to communicate with uh, external services. And the, and the database is MySQL. All the components here are completely open source. There is no commercial dependencies here. 
except for the e-signature, but even that's, that e-signature service can be replaced by, by an open source one. If you find one that, that you're happy with, we can actually replace the uh, commercial Adobe EcoSign e-signature solution with an open source solution. Um, and, and so Spring, Spring is, 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 is an open source platform. All the frameworks that you see here are completely open source. Are there any questions about the uh, software architecture? Yes. Mom, my name required is on the HIE. Uh, Hello? Yeah. Just go ahead. Uh, is the asset server required on the HIE side or not? Uh, you're talking about the, the consent to share uh, service? The access con uh, Can you repeat your question, please? Sorry, my question was, uh, is, is a consent server required on the HIE side, or is, is the, the service handled on your side? No, so we can actually deploy the consent to share repository or the consent to share server, if you want, the application. Let's, let's call it the application. We can actually deploy the consent to share application at the HIE level. Or we can actually also host that application for you. So we have flexibility in how we deploy the application. It can be deployed for a single healthcare provider uh, at the HIE level, or we can also host it in the cloud. Uh, and then, if we host, host the system in the cloud for you, we can still communicate with the MPI, uh, the, the uh, MPI service that you have at the HIE level. We can get demographics information from the MPI, the Master Vision Index, at the HIE level. We can use your resource locator service. We can use your provider's directory uh, as well. So uh, we have deployment flexibility, but also our components can talk to the to, to your components, to the HIE's components, uh, because in addition to having a loosely coupled system, we also have uh, what uh, service-oriented architecture. So components in our system are exposed through a WSDL. So we have a web service interface for each of our components. So, for, so because of that, we can actually talk uh, with, with different uh, uh, client systems. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's, it's quite flexible how we deploy and how we integrate. OK, uh, there's a question yeah. from uh, Oddly. Uh, yes. Um, we're all actually in Maryland and in Prince George County. We have a, a, a health information exchange deployed there, and uh, we're using uh, one that's really consistent with IHE okay. profiles, master patient index, XTS repository query, uh, and we're also interfaced with an EHR system that oh. clinics in the county decided to use. My question is: um, We manage consent using BPPC. Can you accept that type of structured document to, to import into your repository to manage consent as well? Yes, absolutely. So we can, es we can export policies. Actually, the, the policies in our system have been designed based on standards like IHE, BPPC, um, CDR to consent directives, and ZACML. So we can support IHE, BPPC. We can export and import policies uh, in IHE BPPC, but the issue with uh, IHE BPPC is that it's not executable. What, what I mean by that is that uh, if you use XML, if you use XML policies, XML policies are actually executable. Uh, in XML, we have this notion of policy decision point, so we can actually execute the policy automatically. Uh, IHE BPC is more for like scan documents, so someone creates a consent directive on paper, signs with consent paper, and then they scan it into a system, and they wrap it around a CDA document, that is an IHE BPC document. So we can support that if you want, uh, but uh, the limitation of that is that we, um, go ahead, Alvin. We um we use both, so we use BPPC. We also use Xaxml as well. Uh, perfect, we perfect. Can support, we can support both. 
Okay, that's good. So we, we support the, we, we we actually can export policies into three different formats. BPP, BPPC, CDR2, and XML. Excellent. Okay, this is Bear again. If, if, you, if you do have a question, go ahead and raise your hand or send me a chat, and I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and open up the mics one at a time, um, just due to all the uh, feedback we're getting. Uh, that, we're actually going to talk here, uh, we're going to have another slide here that actually talks about a little bit more about how everything is laid out and how the process works. Okay. So the last two slides really showed the patient-facing application. And you're going to see a demonstration of the live system in a moment. What I'm showing right now is the back-end system. A patient has captured the consent directives using our online system. Now, the request is coming. So we have a patient, John. So John has captured his privacy preferences using the patient-facing web application. Now, the request is coming asking to obtain John's medical record. So let's say John is, uh, has, has a provider at Hospital A, and then we have a doc Dr. Bob requesting John's document. Now there is a request. And we can support a pool-based scenario where a healthcare provider is requesting a clinical document from another healthcare provider. That's a pool scenario. The second scenario is a push scenario. The push scenario is typically a referral. So a primary care doctor is referring a, a patient to a psychiatrist. So now when a request comes in, what happens? So what happens is that what we do is we export, we export the policies out of consent to share into ZACML. And ZACML is an executable policy language. So we put that in the Patient, you can see that we have something called a consent store there. Patient, organizational, and jurisdictional policies. So we store the policies in an XTSB repository. It's like a database of repositories. Okay? So now what happens is that a request comes in. We have this component called a ZACML PDP. That's the right component uh, uh, that you're looking at. Uh, the PDP, the ZACML PDP is the policy decision point. A request comes in for John's medical record. So we, we, we send that request to the ZACML policy decision point. We ask the PDP to make a permit or deny decision based on John's consent directives. If John says, do not share my documents, the PDP will return a deny. If John says, you can share my documents, but I do not want you to share HIV, HIV information. In that case, the PDP will, re will return a permit, but with what we call obligation. The obligation in this case is to redact HIV information out. So that is what we call executable policies. The, it's not like a paper-based policy. When, we, when, you, when you use paper-based uh, consent directives, paper-based consent directives are not executable. Uh, these policies, in our case, are executable. So the ZACML PDP will return a decision. So you can see here in my uh, in this example, we have a permit. John is authorizing exchange of his clinical document with the obligation to redact HIV. And John is also asking to redact substance abuse information. And John is authorizing this exchange for the purpose of treatment. So that's what the policy decision point does. Now what we do is we take John's clinical document, the patient CCDA, and we extract clinical facts out of his document. Clinical facts really are, uh, consist of a code and a code system. So for example, HIV has uh, a code in SNOMED. In, in, in this example, drug abuse disorder has a code in SNOMED, which is 2641. 6006. So we extract a list of clinical facts from the clinical document of, of John, and we use a terminology, a terminology server to make some inferencing. So for example, as you know, uh, uh, medical terminologies are, are hierarchical. So you have a concept like substance abuse disorder, but drug abuse disorder is a child concept of drug abuse disorder. Okay. And that is called a subsocial relationship. 
Drug abuse disorder is a specific kind of substance abuse disorder. So what we're doing here is John says in the obligation do not share substance abuse disorder. So we use the terminology server to determine whether uh, the, the code 2641-6006 is a substance abuse disorder. So the terminology server is able to return what we call inferred clinical facts. Okay? Uh, and then we feed that into Drulz. Drulz is the uh, the, the, the intelligent piece in our system. Drulz is a rules engine. It has three sets of, of inputs. First are the obligations from the PDP, the clinical facts from the patient's clinical document, but also we give uh, policy experts the ability to capture specific business rules for data segmentation. Okay, so uh, healthcare providers have privacy experts. Uh, those privacy experts, policy experts, can, can create business rules uh, for data segmentation. So rules will take those three sets of inputs and generate a set of segmentation directives. Okay, so we use those segmentation directives to do the actual segmentation. And segmentation means that we are redacting stuff out of the clinical document. We are tagging the document. We are encrypting the documents. All of those processing uh, uh, steps are called segmentation. So you can see that uh, the rules is, is the central system's getting directives from the policy decision point, from the clinical document, and from, uh, from policies that have been created by policy experts. So that's how the data segmentation process works. Uh, and this has been demonstrated. We've done, we have uh, created a, a pilot demonstration of this architecture with a VA, and we've successfully demonstrated this capability uh, uh, at the HL7 conference in, in last September and also at HIPS 13. Uh, so that's how the segmentation works. Uh, any questions on this one? Uh, there are. Uh Let's see, four questions. Um, start with um, Joe Hanson, the question, how robust is the API and how difficult would it be to leverage the API in a patient portal? For example, personal, uh, personal health record. Is the dual authentication available through the API? Yes, absolutely. So uh, now, Joel, you've been unmuted. This Joel, Joel Hanson. <laughs> okay. okay. So um, the, the the patient facing web application uh, has a web API which is based on JSON. So it's a RESTful service uh, using JSON messages. The authentication is based on OAuth two. Uh, so. Uh, client applications, uh, a portal, a patient portal, for example, or an EHR, can use that the web API to, to communicate with the consent to share application. So, for example, a patient portal can retrieve the consent directive from our system using that web API, using the RESTful JSON web API. And the authentication will be provided based on OR2. So using OR2, we can also do some. We can also provide single sign-on capabilities. For example, some patient portals uh, already implement uh, the uh, OR2 specification. With OR2, an, a user with an existing Gmail account, for example, can, look, can 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 reuse their Gmail account to log into our system. So we we do have the ability to uh, to do uh, single sign-on. If you have a, a patient portal and, uh, and that patient portal supports single sign-on, we can actually integrate consent to share and the, and the patient portal so that there is only one single sign-on, for example. So we can, we can do that. Or if you prefer to communicate with our system using a SOAP-based web service, we can also expose the service layer as the SOAP web service. So we, we definitely have the ability, and in terms of robustness, our system is, is, is very robust. Uh, we use best practices in development. Uh, we, we do 
performance testing, we do security. We have penetration testing. Penetration testing. Okay. Yeah. So, Joel, Joel Hanson, did that uh, answer your question? It did. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay. Great. Um, and there is a uh, question here from Jeremy Leventhal. Uh, Jeremy, um, I think I have to unmute everybody in order to speak. So, uh, everybody, uh, stand by here. Jeremy, go ahead. Hi, uh, Jeremy Leventhal. Uh, I work for Riggins Street Institute here uh, in Indiana. Uh, we obviously are very closely coupled with the Indiana Health Information Exchange. We're doing a, pro a project that's that's quite tangential to the work you're doing. We've we've heard a lot about your project. This is, this is really cool stuff. So, thank you. Um, I, had a, I had a couple questions. You don't have to necessarily go through all of them, but. Um, you, you guys keep mentioning uh, about clinical documents, and I know that you're referring to the, the CDA or CCD. Um, so we are talking about the discrete results. I'm assuming that you're not including notes and doing any sort of natural language processing to distill out information. So when you say HIV, uh, you're, you're talking about just an actual clinical result or a diagnosis or, or things like that. Is that correct? Yes. We, 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 are, we are only supported coded entries right now. So we are looking for a code in, 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 in the standard terminology, like SNOMED, LOINC, or RxNum. So we are really working with, uh, with highly coded entries right now in the CCDA. Uh, uh, and, but as you mentioned, uh, we can uh, not, not, we are not doing it right now, but in the future we can use natural language processing for extracting clinical concepts from text. Uh, that is also possible, uh, but we are not doing that right now. Yeah, it, that will definitely not be part of or not be in place in time for a pilot. So it will, will only be able to um, affect coded data. So um, if you were to have, for, for example, sensitive information in clinical notes, they would likely all have to be stripped out of the record. Um, let's see, Oddly had a question. Oddly? Adley? Can you hear me now? Yes, I Hello? can. Can I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, it's Adley. Adley. Uh, this is in regards to the state of Maryland and with um, the smart system that you have there and the policies written. So taking into account that um, behavioral health, addictions, and mental health, there's definite state law, state regulations uh, that have to stay in place regardless. Are you going to be able to have those policies written into Examol that could assist um, an organization that wants to follow consent, um, needs consent-driven transactions to leverage something you have to enforce it so that our HIE can enforce your policies? Or does that have to come down to the, the end user to try to determine what policy they need um, run? Uh, so, so I think the answer to the question is that uh, the the actual policy that uh, that is created is 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 highly contextual. So, depending on where you uh, where where you where you are receiving healthcare services. So, for example, if you receive healthcare services in New York, uh, if you are an adolescent, uh, because there are specific privacy healthcare privacy state laws for for uh, uh, adolescents in, in, in New York City. So the, all, of, all of that, all of, all of those contextual information can play a role in, in how you actually build your, your policy. Uh, and we have a flexibility to, stop, to support that. It, we, we can customize this system. And as you know, ZACML is a very robust policy language. It can support any kind of access control policy. Uh, it can support absolutely any kind of access control policy. So we, we can customize uh, this uh, this system to support different regulation, different laws uh, at, at, at the organizational level, at the, at the state level. Um, we, we so the system because because of of our support for ZACML, we can handle di different types of information. So, but but. The, the consent form that is that is presented to the user is highly contextual. Uh, uh, so so uh, so the contest uh, drives uh, the the actual creation or uh, authoring of the consent, uh, and, and we can customize uh, the the interface, the user experience, for, to support different regulations and different environments. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, question from uh, Amy Landry. Um, what about a document like a PDF? of a discharge summary that includes reference to drug abuse disorder. So that would be very similar to, to case notes. Um, we can't segment out a, a PDF, um, at least in this version of the uh, software that will be available in the fall. Amy, did that answer your question? Did that ah, answer yeah, your question? Yeah, it did. Yeah, your last, the, the, the question that was asked just a few minutes ago, I think, um, about supporting um, natural language processing, that answered it. Thank you. Great. And also, a primary goal of our system is completely take paper out of the process. Uh, so everything is electronic. Uh, constraint directives are created. They can be revoked. They can be signed electronically. And they can be executed also. That's very important. They are executable policies. So that's the uh, underlying principle here. Uh, eliminating paper, being able to sign consent anywhere, anytime, and being able to execute policies automatically. Okay, next question uh, is from uh, uh, Judd DeLoss. Uh, if a patient withholds uh, the information pursuant to consent, does the system notify the healthcare provider that information is being segmented or withheld so the provider knows they are not relying on a complete record? Uh, the answer to that is that um, we are implementing the system to the uh, implementation guide that was defined by the ONC. And in that definition, uh, there is um, no indication that the record has been uh, segmented. Um, that is, um, that possibly could be implemented based on you know, if the rules are written uh, um, to do such. But according to the ONC's uh, implementation guide, uh, that is, uh, is not done. And I'm going to unmute Judd here, uh, see if we uh, answer this question. Good, thank you for, uh, actually Judd had to leave the room. This is Renee Popovich. Hey. I, I work with him at, at the law firm and thank you for answering the question. It answers it. We okay, appreciate great. it. You're welcome. Um, from uh, Carolyn Turner, does the segment uh, segment the data include a notice of redisclosure prohibition? The answer is uh, yes. Um, that is in the implementation guide from, from the ONC, and it does um, include um, non-disclosure. Uh, um, let me find Carolyn here. Uh, I'm not seeing Carolyn in the list. Maybe she left the meeting. And then Lisa Moon, can the electronic consent management system span uh, multiple and diverse healthcare settings like long-term care, rehab, nursing homes, social services, and hospitals and clinics? Um, and in the uh, pilot, um, we will not be uh, spanning that many uh, domains. But yes, um, it certainly could, um, you know, in a, in a, in a full implementation. Uh, Joel, Rocky, do you have any comments on that? Okay. All right. We're going to go ahead. I'm going to uh, turn the uh, um, show over here to Barack, and he's actually going to demonstrate um, some of the software. That was your last slide, correct, Joel? Okay. Is, there, is everybody uh, had the meeting of readiness review, which was um, back in the very early spring. We had anticipated that CDC. <laughs> I'm just going to take it that everybody can see uh, Barack's uh, screen. Uh, if uh, if you can't see the uh, uh, pretty doctor here uh, with, with logging to uh, your C2S account, um, go ahead and shoot me a message or raise your hand, please. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, you're currently seeing the consent to share uh, web application. So I'm just going to go through the key components here and then uh, introduce you to our application. Okay, so uh, 
this is basically a login screen here. The patient um, just inputs their username and password. We don't have the uh, two-factor authentication implemented yet, but that's in the works. So uh, Joel had uh, talked about the, uh, the second factor um, authentication. So that piece is being implemented. So simply here, I have a login. And I'm pre so I'm presented here with a uh, my my uh, account page here, my home page, and you'll notice two uh, important sections here. One is the inbox notification, and the other one is the educational content. So um, inbox notification is obviously for any notifications that are coming in or going out of the system. So in for for instance, we have the uh, the patients. Um, may receive, uh, get, may get notified regarding a consent that was requested uh, by a particular provider. So here, for instance, we have an example here. Um, two new requests uh, came in, and um, obviously the patient has not viewed them yet. And um, also a summary of how many consents have been accepted and how many were rejected. So they can uh, click on that and get details as to when that occurred and, and to which provider. Um, there's also uh, a box here that, that shows the current connection. So we allow patients to add um, different connections. Um, there's different types of connections. Um, so here we just have an example. And uh, down the bottom here, this is the educational content. So educational content is a big piece of our application, so we want the, the patients to make uh, informed consent, give informed, informed consent, and education is a big part of this. So to demonstrate one capability here, we have um, a basically a multimedia embedded here uh, in this link. So when I click on this, um, uh, we basically play a video about um, healthcare privacy and particularly in how it relates to consent to, sh uh, consent to share technology. Um, I don't have audio here, but you know, uh, it's, a, it's a nice introduction here. Um, so we will have many uh, multimedia content uh, embedded in uh, throughout the site in different sections um, you know, for the purpose of education. Um, but would you... Do you have any comments on this? No, no, only to stress the point that we understand that one of the biggest hurdles for any type of system this, this complex is, is to really educate the user. In this case, it's the patient. And so we have embedded lots of educational material, or the, the idea, the goal is to embed a lot of educational material throughout the site. So some of it will be content that will just sort of bring the user up to speed on what consent is, right? Because most of the people who are going to be using the system aren't going to know what a consent is and how that relates to them and their medical history and their privacy. And so a lot of the content will be there available in a library type of format where they can just access it at any point. But then they're gonna, they're, they're, you're also going to find that the user is going to need education um, on demand. That means that, say for example, they might be entering in a consent or creating a consent, uh, they might want to know how certain types of settings relate to them. And so there will be educational material that will just automatically either guide them through the process of creating consent, or it will be readily available for them to click on so that they can learn more about how the settings and configuration to their consent might affect them and their, and their privacy and their health records. So education is a big piece, a big component, and uh, is a work in progress. Okay. Uh, one other important thing I want to mention here, um, my colleague Joel also mentioned, talked about the, uh, some of the technologies we use while you know, developing uh, our web application here, is the uh, uh, responsive design um, technology here. So I'll, I'll quickly demonstrate that here. So Right now, uh, we're kind of viewing the page in a full maximi maximum size, but um, depending on the, the size, the dimensions of the different devices, the, the, the pages actually adapt to the size. So just to quickly demonstrate that here. 
So I can, if I were to view this on a tablet, so you will see that uh, components on the page will start collapsing here. So for instance, um, here, if I stop here, you'll see that um, things kind of have been, you know, components have been kind of stacked uh, on top of each other and, and the menu has collapsed here, but I can still have access to it. If I click on it, I still get the menu and just to get to a certain uh, piece of information, I only thing I do is just scroll and I have access to it. Now one of the reasons why we wanted to build a system that was adaptable, that meaning, meaning that um, it, it could fit into a mobile device, is that we did quite a bit of research and the tr as most of you know, the trend is leading towards mobile technology. Everyone these days is using either a tablet or a phone to access the internet. And the estimates are that by 2016, uh, you're, you're going to have the majority of, of people accessing the Internet, not through their desktops, but through their mobile devices, such as a smartphone or a, a tablet device. So we want to make sure that this system is uh, something that's usable across those types of devices. Certainly one of the considerations was with the, uh, with the safe uh, for safety net services, um, for example, uh, a homeless person can be more likely to have a mobile phone than, than access to a desktop. So we want to make sure that we have one piece of code that can uh, um, be used on many different uh, many different devices. Um, so we have talked about the uh, that we uh, have the ability. Uh, the patient has the ability to add providers um, to their, basically, the, to their uh, medical, uh, to their account here. Uh, basically, that's done through My Connections. So My Connections allows patients to add providers as well as legal representatives. So we have one provider added here, um, and I'm going to demonstrate how that how that works. So we're going to add another provider so we can demonstrate the consent piece. So um, basically this is, this is um, as, we, as Joel talked about this before, this is talking to a national provider uh, lookup service. But uh, the, it, you know, as you can imagine, there are um, hundreds and thousands of uh, providers listed there. So we, we give the patient the ability to um, basically uh, you know, to, to, to pinpoint the provider that they're looking for, we provide several uh, search fields here. So, for instance, the patient can search for a provider by location. Um, they can search by uh, gender, uh, uh, speci speciality here, uh, phone number, and uh, obviously, and also by first name and last name. So, uh, I'll just here simply use the uh, location feature here, so I'll search by a provider in Baltimore, Maryland, and hit search, and this will return a list of providers that are available, and um, I'm going to go ahead and pick this provider, this hospital here, Montsecure, so, and, and um, you'll see that it's added to the current list of providers that uh, for the patient. So I just wanted to add, uh, in the context of an HIE, if the HIE has a provider's directory, we can actually use that as the source of healthcare provider information. In this specific demonstration, we are using the national NPI database, but we can limit the search to a provider's if an HIE has an LDAP directory of providers, uh, of, of, of all the providers participating in the HIE, we can restrict the search to that list only. Okay. Um, next, uh, go over to My Consent. 
So this is where the patient actually creates the consent. So um, uh, another nice feature is this sort of goes along with the educational piece here. Um, we basically introduce, uh, if, if, especially if the patient is new to the system, we use um, you know certain guides to um, basically uh, in, inform or educate the, the patient for how to uh, uh, input certain values into the system. So this is here uh, a uh, JavaScript technology that we use here to uh, basically provide the guide, describes what, what the field is for, and uh, and they can basically click uh, next here and um, and uh, provides a visual clue and, and describes the field. And uh, this is basically configurable, optional. Once they learn the system, this can be turned off. Um, so this is the main consent, uh, add a consent screen here. So uh, the patient is pre presented with several fields here. So first off, um, the patient is asked to uh, specify the provider that they uh, authorize to share their uh, um, medical information. So uh, here I will pick Jamie Pearson here. And next, uh, who can this information disclose to? Which other providers, uh, health, healthcare providers? So uh, in this case, we'll pick the uh, Bon Secures Hospital here. And also, make sure to go back to the first one and hit do it again because it didn't take the authorized. Sorry. If they hit the plus. Okay. Okay. So um, by default, the share all my medical information is turned on, but the patient has the ability to um, deselect, if you will, which piece of information they would not like to share. Um, so we have categorized them by sensitivity, medical information. So let me go through these here. So sensitivity categories, for instance, could be substance abuse information related sensitivity, um, obviously HIV um, information related sensitivity. Um, medical information categories are the, the you know, allergies, um, you know, um, for instance, family history, uh, diagnoses, things, of, things like that. And then clinical document type is uh, basically su summarization of episode notes, uh, consultation notes, like a C32 document. And um, in addition, they can also specify a specific SNOMED code. And um, the system will take that and, you know, um, that basically becomes an obligation. So, um, you know, uh, the, that will become a directive for the data segmentation. Uh, so, let me go back here. So, we'll just say we, the, for this patient, we do not want to share any substance abuse related information. So, that's also indicated here. And then, um, they choose for which purposes, purpose of use. So, we have several of them listed here. By default, they're all turned on. But um, for this one, for this patient, we'll just uh, deselect healthcare marketing. So patient would not like to share their information for the purpose of healthcare marketing. Then um, every consent has a start and end date. So it expires at a certain date. So um, just pick today's date here. Up 28, yes. And then... Uh, So this will be uh, for one year duration. And finally, I'll go ahead and save this consent. So um, here you see that the consent has been added to the patient account. Uh, we can preview this consent. It will be in uh, PDF format. Um, let me resize this here.
So it is basically uh, a uh, the, 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 the basically it describes what the consent is for. So uh, has the name of the patient, their date of birth, and um, the provider who is authorized uh, to share uh, their uh, their cons uh, their medical information, and then who it can be disclosed to, and what sensitivity category, and what for what purpose. And here is the 42 CFR Part Two uh, disclosure, and finally the expiration date. I just wanted to add that. The consent authoring user experience with the form that, that, that you saw and even this PDF document, all of that is based on the 42 CFR regulation. The sensitivity values like HIV and, 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 and drug abuse, all of those are HL7 value sets. So everything that you're looking at here is based on standards and regulation. Uh, we have not invented anything new here. We are implementing the, the, the regulation and we are enforcing the standard. And also you see here that for providers we have an NPI number. Because in this example you have a jamming person is uh, the, uh, the provider that you're authorizing to exchange, uh, but there could be many jamming person in the US. So the, the NPI number is very important. That is how we uniquely identify your provider for accountability. Go ahead and close this. So um, for this consent to become um, active, the, the user has to sign it. So um, and in which case it will make it legally binding. So there is a button here, sign now. And uh, we talked about the Adobe EcoSign. That's the service we're currently using uh, for e-signature. So, um, I'll demonstrate that in a second here. So once the user clicks on that button, um, the the uh, basically the form is forwarded to. Uh, we, we we basically talk to a service uh, which is on the Adobe side, and we uh, they get to, they they get the request, they process it, and they will in return send a link to the the user with instructions on how to. Uh, Sign the document. So I just received that email, and basically it, it tells them to uh, click on this link to go to the to the Adobe site and and finish e-signing the document. So they have a choice here to either uh, sign the document and basically permit or or refuse it. Right. So in this case, I'm I'm authorizing, and so I'm going to sign it. So I'll just get a notification that we successfully e-signed the agreement. And when I go back here, you see that the uh, consent, this current consent, is uh, basically indicated as being signed. Uh, we have the ability to export it. Um, we can view the consent, or we can remove, remove or revoke the consent. So if I view this consent now, this version will be the signed version. We have a service um, on our end that that basically uh, pulls from Adobe Adobe's uh, Adobe server and checks for the status. So as soon as the a document has been indicated as signed, we pull the document back to our repository here. So you can see that um, the the signature, my signature here, and also uh, it's digitally signed as well. So there is a certificate from Adobe, and so it's digitally signed as well. You can, I, I'm not sure if everyone is seeing this, but it's to the on the left top corner here. Um, so at this at this point, the the document is legally binding. So uh, and it's active. So there's a uh, question came in on chat about the uh, our our e-signatures um, 
uh, um, are they valid in all states? Um, I didn't know the answer to that one. Yes, so uh, we don't know the situation in all states right now, but I can tell you that the state of Iowa is using the same solution. Uh, it's called Adobe EcoSign. So the, the state of Iowa is, 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 is accepting, is currently accepting e-signature by Adobe EcoSign for all state contracts. Okay, so, but I don't know exactly what is the current state of the law in all states in the U.S., but definitely uh, there are states uh, that are already accepting this solution, even for state contract documents. Okay. And uh, Maureen had her hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to make it clear, because I, I wasn't sure if it was clear to the audience, that, um, um, that this isn't a standard consent that's kind of required um, through the system, that um, you know, any, you know, organization that implements the system would be able to define the parameters of the consent and define the choices that a patient would be given. And so if you, you know, if, if a given organization didn't want to give a patient all of those options for what data they could um, withhold, then they wouldn't have to. They, they could say, um, you know, if, if it was really only substance abuse information that they were concerned about, they could have that one option there alone. Um, and so, you know, there's complete flexibility to define the parameters of the consent and the, and the patient choices that, that, you know, an individual institution wants to give. Okay, and <clears throat> yes. So next, um, also, uh, and and, and my, my colleague Joel also talked about this, the audit trail. So each and every action um, that, the, the, that occurs in the system, so that's basically initiated by the patient, is being uh, audit logged. And we have, an, we have a nice active, active history screen here that basically shows um, on what occurred on a particular date and time. So you can see that um, our, a, a while ago when I added uh, the provider, we, we see this uh, uh, indicated here that created a new entry and um, the organizational provider and who, who made this update or uh, modification. So um, we're, we will have more enhancements to this as we go along. We will even show uh, the details of what got changed. Um, so because we're, we're snapshotting um, um, every record at a particular state, so we can, we can call it back even for uh, a consent and all its parameters are being snapshot. So that's, that's it. If I'm sorry. Okay. Um, sure. Yeah. This is also uh, it, w one last uh, piece of uh, one last screen that I also want to show here. Um, just mention about this. So we allow the patient. We give patients the ability to upload their uh, medical documents. Um, so there is a there is a form, a basic form to do that um, to capture it. And there's different uh, document types here. Uh, or um, they can they can input it basically manually manually enter their medical information because um, we use the terminology uh, service as as we mentioned before so um, they can look look up the uh, a particular um, concept by by code or by its name and they can add it to their uh, to their account and um, and, and 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 create a medical medical record. Okay, so what you've seen so far is the ability for a patient to capture their privacy preferences. The next step is to export uh, that consent, those consent directives in an executable format like XACML. Uh, and then uh, when a request comes in to obtain the clinical document of that patient, the policy decision point will get or retrieve the consent directive that the patient just created and to make a decision, a, a permit or a deny decision. Okay, so that's how the system works. The patient creates their consent directives electronically, signs the, the consent uh, directive. We export the consent directive in XML, 
and then at 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 the request time, we retrieve that uh, that policy that consider those considerations, and we make it uh, we automatically make an access control decision uh, based on the wishes of a patient uh, uh, to to deny or 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 permit the exchange and uh, the privacy preferences about what to exchange, what can be exchanged. For example, I, if a patient says, I do not want to exchange HIV information, or I do not want to share my uh, drug abuse information, uh, those things are called obligations. So, it, so, so in that case, what we do is the policy decision point will return a permit, uh, but with the obligations to, ex to redact out uh, uh, those those sensitive those sensitive information based on the privacy choices of the patient. Mm -hmm. okay. So just as a um, while we're on that topic here, so here is a sample uh, C thirty two document. So for a sample patient, um, so we were talking about obligation. So basically obligations. So the patient provides their consent, and uh, once the consent is stored, and it, it and, and as Joel mentioned, they're in a form of uh, executable format. So, um, so in, here's an example. For instance, for this patient, we have an obligation to uh, redact any substance abuse-related information, um, as well as. Uh, and medication, uh, any, uh, in this case it's an antidepressant medication. So this is their original uh, C32 document and, uh, and there ha hasn't been any tagging occurred or no uh, segmentation, so no redaction, no masking. But um, so if there is an obligation, and in this case there is one, there's, uh, we, we have an obligation to redact substance abuse information and uh, the medication. You should say that the, the uh, text in red there are just in, are not actually in the document. Which one? The red text. No, they're not. They're just... Uh, uh, they're, they're for example. For they're for example. Absolutely. Yeah, this is all... Very young, you may not realize Right. That. So you will notice that the, the in here the substance abuse information has been redacted out. So it's, it doesn't, it no longer exists there as well as the uh, medication. Yes. So all of that segmentation was done automatically. We, we retrieve the uh, consent directives from, our, from consent to share, and we apply those segmentation directives against the original C32. And that is why you, you no longer see the uh, substance abuse information there has been redacted. All of that is completely automatic. Uh, but to do that, you really need to have executable policies. And that, that is what ZACUMEL provides. Okay, um, we have a question here from uh, Denise Webb. Will you be piloting with any of the HIE uh, vendors such as uh, Medicity, Opta, Marine, et cetera? Um, they're using uh, Medicity in uh, Wisconsin, um, and their mental health laws are more restrictive than HIPAA. So the, the answer is that in the pilot, we expect that um, you know, we, we are going to run into HIE vendors and, and certainly integrate with whatever um, HIE vendor system um, is, uh, is in place there. If it's, if it's not homegrown, obviously it's from a, from a vendor. Um, and more restricted policies would just be um, um, having the right policies in the system per the jurisdictional or organizational uh, area. Uh, Denise, did that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Now I answered a few questions uh, via chat to the audience there. Um, uh, Adley had a, has another question uh, once again about uh, BPPC CDA and policy IDs um, attached to the document. If you store them in your repository and they're from dish. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and open your mic, uh, Adley, and let you ask your question. Please go ahead. Adley, are you on? 
I'm sorry, I keep internally muting out. So if you take this um, BPPC CDA with a policy ID and store it into your policy repository, and I'm in a particular clinic that just enforced this, and let's say I'm from a different organization, can I just query your policy repository, pick that up, and enforce it? Okay, so the way the exchange is orchestrated is, is this. Uh, every endpoint has what we call a policy enforcement point. So mm -hmm. every data source in an HIE is a policy enforcement point. All requests go through that point first. So let's say we have a policy enforcement point for healthcare provider A. So any request will go to that point first, and then the policy enforcement point for that data source, for that hospital or healthcare provider, will then retrieve the policies for the specific patient. Okay, so let's say we have a hospital that is, that is participating in an HIE. That hospital is a data source. It has clinical documents. It will stay in the policy enforcement point there. All, all requests coming into that hospital will go through that policy enforcement point. So if a request is coming in for John's medical record, the policy enforcement point will ask the PDP to make a decision. The PDP, in turn, will go and get the policies for John from the policy store and then make a decision. Now, theoretically, theoretically, the policy store can be anywhere. You have flexibility in that you can have an HIE centralized policy store. Okay, you can do that. Or you can have an organization specific policy store. Uh, so, so it's just a sub request at the, at, at the end of the day. Where the PDP will send, a, will retrieve the policies from a policy store. Mm -hmm. That policy store, as I said, can be local or maybe centralized. Yeah, I think yeah, you, you answered my question. It basically revolves around the policy enforcement point, and mainly is I'm trying to figure out mechanisms or ways to, let's say, if you have a if you have a PEP, right? that if I can access yours in a particular place like in Maryland that already has written policy, it will ease the user or the organization from trying to determine what policy they need to enforce because sometimes it's very ambiguous to them. It, it's kind of difficult for them to figure out. However, if it's according to a particular state law and you have it written in a policy store and I can access it, it could really help the end user, like at least give them guidance. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. But uh, also, the ZACML specification has this notion of a request attributes. When a, ZAC, when a request is coming in to the PEP, uh, it's, it is containing what we call a ZACML request. A ZACML request has uh, request attributes. So for example, who is making the request? Uh, for what purpose? What is the role of the person making the request? Is it a nurse or a psychiatrist or a psychologist? Uh, and also, what is the jurisdiction? So all of those are request attributes that create a, a context for the decision. Okay, the NPIO provider, the, their functional role, the, the applica applicable state laws, all of all of that represent contextual information that is used to make a, a decision. So so we can determine, you know, what are all the applicable laws based on the request attributes. Okay, we've got uh, another question from uh, Joel Dickinson, and Joel, open open your mic here. But the question is: uh, Is there a standard that defines substance abuse information, specific problem codes, medications, etc.? That's a uh, a great uh, question. Um, the answer is that uh, SAMHSA is actually working on that, um, but that is uh, one of the uh, big things that uh, needs to be defined. Not only. Uh, um, substance abuse information, but other areas of, of sensitive data. Yeah, so in, in, in the case of some mental health problem, there is a subset of ICD-9 called DSM, DSM-4, uh, and that is a subset of ICD-9 that contains a list of all mental health problems. Uh, however, uh, DSM, DSM, as I said, is just a subset of ICD-9. The problem is that um, substance abuse is a cross-cutting concern, so you can have substance abuse information not only in the problem list but also in the medication list. There are certain medications that clearly indicate that the, that, that, that the patient has a substance abuse problem. There are also specific law in code that indicate that, it is, that, that the patient has substance abuse problems. So 
uh, we, we have uh, an issue there, so we, we, we need to work uh, on determining uh, all the value sets across those terminology standards, not just ICD-9 or SNOMED, but also LOINC, because uh, you can find drug abuse problem in lab results as well. So we need to, to create a subset of LOINC, of, of, of RSNOM, of SNOMED, of, of ICD-10 that allows us to really identify value sets for drug abuse and mental health and HIV and all. And so Joel makes a great point in there, and it really has summed that up, is we, we will have terminology services integration, which will be able to help with that. Joe, did that answer your question? Okay. Um, so Amy has a comment here. Okay, uh, let's see. It's like Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy has his hand up. I'm going to have to. Looks like you're on the identi unidentified phone call. I'm going to have to do the unmute. Jeremy, go hey, ahead. Please. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Bear. Um, so I, I'm not as familiar with the policy side of this. Um, a little bit more familiar with the technical and the clinical and the exchange. Um, but so what, what parts of what you have described or, or maybe you haven't described yet play into the implications since you are providing full patient autonomy, allowing them to, to essentially hide whatever they would like to hide, excluding any business rules that, that may or may not be known to the patient. But, you know, they hide something downstream and it does have those implications. So, uh, yeah, I'll hold that one if you like. Uh, so, Maureen, hold on. Let me, let me mute everybody and then unmute you. Okay. Okay, Maureen, go ahead, please. Okay. It's Maureen Boyle uh, from uh, SAMHSA. Uh, hi, everyone. So, uh, um, that's actually what I was trying to make clear before is that um, is that this is an example consent um, that that you know we're just showing for just to, to, to roll through the process, but the actual details of the consent form um, will be determined by the organization, and so the organization will determine both the the language around the consent that the patient sees, um, as well as um, what consent options the patient has. Um, so very similar to how it's done right now, you know you're team of lawyers will determine, you know, what choices you're willing to give the patient, and then this system will help you execute that consent and to, and to capture the information in a structured way and to actually um, then, you know, execute the uh, whatever type of, um, of data segmentation you are allowing. Um, but the system can absolutely work in a way where, you know, um, I know I know there was a list of, uh, of, of purposes. Um, that, the system would not need to give the patient a list of purposes. It could be, you know, these are for treatment, payments, and operations, and that's your only choice, and um, you know, and, and that's the, the consent. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so the flexibility will be completely there on the side of the healthcare system. Okay, uh, Amy Landry, I just noticed that you, you had a comment and then a question at the end. Um, I just opened your mic, you know, if. if it was answered, or if you had, or if you saw the question. Yeah. So it sounds like in in our reading of what is substance abuse information, as far as being able to share it uh, across um, organizational entities, is that it it has to be coming out of a, a facility that's um, that's somehow related to 42 CFR, <laughs> and that if it's coming, if the information is created by a provider that's not governed under 42 CFR, that that information would then not be protected at the same level. But what I'm hearing now is that SAMHSA is unclear on that and looking to, to define that further. Uh, this is Maureen, am I still unmuted? Yes, you are, we can hear you. Okay, um, so, so you're absolutely correct. So part two information protects any information that's collected by a part two program. Um, and substance abuse information that's collected, say, in primary care um, is not protected by the Part 2 regulations. Um, so, so that's absolutely correct. And, um, however, this can, um, uh, you know, this is a system that, that can comply with any type of, of, of privacy regulation. So you'll be able to 
um, you, uh, to designate what it's like. Uh, <laughs> so you'll be able to redact information that, say, was collected by a Part 2 program um, you know, and, and is subject to the, the non-redisclosure. Um, and protect that information, or this can help with, with state laws such as the HIV prevention, uh, you know, HIV uh, sensitivity or um, or mental health, which uh, where that information can be integrated within a primary care record but still be protected. Um, so this kind of has the total flexibility to to allow you to kind of determine based on you know jurisdictional policies and as well as you know state and federal regulations where those boundaries are and, and okay. what choices should be given. Great. Okay, um, we had a uh, question from uh, Lisa Moon. Um, will other documents like DPOA or guardianship, uh, can they be housed? I guess will and, and where would uh, guardianship documents be housed? Guardianship, what, what is that? Uh, let me, I'm sorry, let me open up Lisa's mic here, maybe she can comment. Okay. Go ahead, Lisa. Lisa? Well, uh, I guess the answer is we don't have uh, any place right now, the guardianship documents. Uh, like a being a guardian to, for someone? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, as Murak showed earlier, um, if the patient is not able to sign their consent directives, uh, a legal representative can be added to do that. Uh, so we have the ability to delegate. The patient can delegate the right to sign, to create an image, sign a consent to a third party. It can be uh, an attorney or parent. Uh, now, if you want, you, you, I think the question was about whether we can store other documents. Our system has the ability to upload any document. So, I mean, if, if that is a, a use case, uh, as what I showed you, we have a, a section of our, of, of our system where you can upload anything. Uh, so, if you have the need to store some uh, legal documents into our system that are related to consent, uh, we can we actually have that now, the ability to upload documents uh, into our system. Uh, how, however, not all those documents will be executable policies, right? So if you upload a PDF, a legal document which is in PDF, maybe a scanned copy of a paper document, uh, we can upload that and you can store that as a reference, but only the, uh, the, the consents that have been exported in the document will be executable. Okay, we have a question uh, from Denise Webb. Uh, what are the implications for interstate exchange uh, whereby bordering states such as Minnesota and Wisconsin may have uh, policies set up differently and a patient may have consents in each state's um, consent to share store? Um, is that a conflict? Yes, so the, the ZACML specification uh, has what is called a policy override. So, for example, for any given exchange scenario or exchange contest, there can be conflicting policies. So, Wisconsin and Minnesota could have, like, uh, 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 multiple policies could be triggered for any given access request. And there is a way to specify in ZACML and override policy. So, if, if, if two policies are in conflict, which one wins? Uh, there are some configurations that can be down there to specify you know, what happens when multiple policies are triggered and they are in conflict. Okay? Uh, now, I don't know if that can support all conflicting scenarios between state policies, but there is a way to configure an override of policies when multiple of them are triggered in ZACML. Denise, did, they, did, ah, excuse me, did that answer your question? Okay. All right. Are there any other questions out there? I don't see any hands raised or uh, any questions on chat. Hey, Maureen, did you have anything to add from the SAMHSA team? No, 
else, just uh, thanks everyone for, for joining. And, and uh, actually, yeah, I do have one thing to add. But if there's anything that people saw um, through this that they're thinking about after, um, you know, in terms of what would make it useful for their system, or you know, if they have concerns about um, uh, about how things are structured and um, concerns about whether it could work in their system, um, to, to please, you know, feel free to reach out to uh, samsa.hit at samsa.hhs.gov. Um, uh, and, and let us know because we, we do want to make sure that the system is, is flexible and, and useful across a broad range of systems. All right. Well, that concludes our uh, demonstration today and, and presentation. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's our pleasure to uh, show you consent to share. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.